Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. A dramatic increase in the number of homeless families with children leads to calls for more public housing in San Francisco. Questions continue over safety inspections of the Bay Bridge following an investigation into alleged falsified reports by Caltran employees. A reform of California's three-strike sentencing law may be on the November ballot. The proposed initiative would exclude nonviolent offenders from automatically serving 25 years to life. Also, the documentary, The Grove, tells the story behind the National AIDS Memorial Grove in Golden Gate Park. Coming up next. I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel are Marisa Lagos, San Francisco Chronicle political reporter, Tom Vekar, KTVU News consumer editor, and Jill Tucker, staff writer also with The Chronicle. Jill, what's the story behind this disturbing rise in, well, the homeless families on the street? San Francisco. You know, I asked that same question this week when they came out with numbers uh, at a press conference at City Hall. Um, you know, where is this coming from? Isn't the economy getting a little better? Shouldn't we be seeing relief? And they said, we aren't exactly sure, but what we do know is we have more families than ever on the waiting list for shelter. L uh, last week, they had 267 families on the wait list for, four, for 59 city-funded rooms. Um, and uh, it's also reflected in the schools where there are 2,200 children who are classified as homeless. That's up 400 from the year before. So we're seeing a very disturbing trend in San Francisco that's in the schools, it's on the streets. Uh, these are families that are not necessarily sleeping in parks or out in the open, but they are in cars, they're in shelters, they are doubled up in apartments, or they're in single resident occupancy hotels, which by definition should be for one person, and are also housing large families. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is a troubling trend uh, across the city that has homeless advocates scratching their heads and trying to figure out what to do with all these families. What's the impact on these kids? I mean, you went out this week and talked to some of them. I mean, how does this Im impact how they can do their schoolwork, just function, grow up? I mean, it seems heartbreaking. It, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And in fact, we've, after these numbers came out and we reported the press conference at City Hall, we, we hung out with a homeless family. Um, we're going to have a detailed, in-depth story Sunday about this. Um, it's gut-wrenching what these, these families go through and what these children go through. These children go through, I mean, they, they're hungry, they're cold, they're tired, and then they're supposed to go to school and read, write, do double-digit multiplication like all the other kids, and then in the spring, take the standardized test that all the other kids who are in Hillsboro or that's Atherton. Um, yeah, that's Rudy. Rudy's in our package on Sunday, and uh, we'll tell you his story. Mm -hmm. These uh, these homeless faces, they are they run the gamut of, of the entire group of people that represent the Bay Area. This isn't just one group of people anymore, is it? No, there, this, there is a wide range. Of course, Hispanic and African American folks are among those uh, with larger numbers, larger percentages in poverty. So you do see a lot of uh, th those faces on the street. But you know, they they run the gamut, and they're, the reasons that they're on the street also run the gamut. It's everything from the old-fashioned alcoholism and and, and um, mental illness to uh, unemployment. I mean, these are families who've been living on the margin for, you know, since the recession hit in 2008. And maybe they've just been hanging in uh, with their apartment and then all of a sudden um, they lose a few hours in, right. on their job. You know, and these are low paying jobs, maybe minimum wage in San Francisco, which is about $10 an hour. 
and all of a sudden that's the difference for them not being able to afford rent and they get evicted and they have nowhere else to go. Is so the city responding? Uh, it, right. uh, or they, I saw the, the demonstration on the steps of City Hall. What, did, what, what were they specifically asking? They for? wanted to meet with Mayor Lee um, and they wanted to have a sit down with them to talk about options, maybe opening up some of the ha vacant public housing units, um, offering a little more rent uh, subsidies or the bridge loans uh, for rent when these families are having difficulty making uh, making payments because if you can keep them in their house, obviously that's better. Um, the the mayor wasn't there. Uh, his staff uh, member offered to talk to them, but they had said that they've been banging their head against the wall. They want to talk to the mayor. Um, they went away and said, you know, we'll be back um, because this problem is not going away. These families are not going away, and it 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 is it is gut wrenching when you talk to them and and you look at how much they want to work how much they want to feed their kids, how much they want to be somewhere other than the streets or cars or couches, um, and, uh, and there's nowhere for them to go. It, it's tough. Do you think, I mean, do you think this could even be less than are actually out there? Because you talked about families doubling up, um, you know, people living with friends. When, when you're out there talking to, to the Homeless Coalition, I mean, do they think that this problem could even be bigger, that there are a lot of people just hanging on, as you said, that could be in this situation soon? You no, know, they, they said that they don't have an accurate count, that their last homeless count found 95 uh, homeless families. And we know there's 2,200 kids that are classified homeless in the schools, so the numbers are way off. Um, it's difficult to, to count how many there are because you have to self-identify in the right. schools. Um, you have to identify, you know, living in a shelter and these other types of situations in order to be classified as homeless. They can't go find them. You know, right. they can't knock on doors and see if there's, you know, four <laughs> families living in a in a studio apartment. So it's it's tough to count them. They estimate that there are 5,000 members of families who are homeless in San Francisco right now. Wow. The school, well, finally, the school district is responding. The school district has and continues to respond. They have to dip into their general fund to help pay for services, but they do give homeless kids free mini passes. They give them counseling. They give them tutoring. They give them backpacks. Um, you know, they give them yeah. uniforms. So they are doing everything they can because it, homeless kids have such problems that if they don't address those needs, mm -hmm. these kids can't learn. Wow. Well, at least the schools are responding and the city is now made aware. Uh, there's another story where uh, we took a long time to get a response, and that was over some problems, uh, Tom Baker, that you reported on here with inspections of the new Bay Bridge going up. It's been going on for years. Uh, this is the latest uh, example of a problem, and what you have is an incredibly complex, one kind in the world structure called the New Eastern Span of the Bay Bridge. And because it's built on earthquake ground and because it's built very specifically, there's nothing else like it. Uh, so you have to do everything kind of as you go. Well, part of making sure that it will survive an earthquake because its job is to not only survive an earthquake but to be in service after an earthquake, you have to make sure that everything that you designed is actually put into the bridge in the way that it was designed, in the way that it was contemplated. And on top of that, you usually over-design something like this since it's going to take such punishment. Well, what we're finding out is that in some cases, uh, at least in one case, a guy who was supposed to be doing some critical inspections, which had been previously inspected by the um, contractor, uh, but this was to verify. This is to trust, but to verify. Uh, apparently, wasn't doing his job very well. He wasn't calibrating the equipment, and he was taking readings that may or may not be accurate. He may not have taken readings at all. Uh, there weren't uh, sufficient documents to back this up, and in some cases, uh, after he had left the Bay Bridge project, he was uh, found to have absolutely falsified records in a way that is illegal and may result in some criminal prosecution. So what does all this mean? What it all means is that this uh, structure that was going to initially cost somewhere around a billion dollars, which is now $6.3 billion or something like that, has some question marks, which it should not have. Will it likely survive an earthquake? Probably it will. But there's enough of a doubt being raised by not doing certain kinds of inspections on the most critical parts of this thing. This is the, the very underpinning of the entire bridge sunk way deep into the bay and holding the road up out of the bay uh, that uh, Caltrans finds itself in the unenviable position of having to react to stories from a very enterprising reporter up in Sacramento at the Bee who looked through some of the stuff and said, there's no proof here that you actually did this and you can't prove it. And in many cases, Caltrans can't prove it. So Caltrans has some real credibility problems going against it right now. And did they, I mean, 
who knew what and when did they know it? I mean, <laughs> is this something that it should have taken a bee investigation to, for them to come out and, and deal with? Well, let's put it this way. The, the things that were known about three projects, two in Southern California, one on a sign here in Oakland about the, the foundations of those particular structures, uh, were all attached to the same guy who falsified records. Now, that was some years after he had worked on the Bay Bridge, but he had worked on the Bay Bridge. Right. Don't you think somebody from Caltrans would have seriously gone back and taken a look at that, knowing that this is a third rail of government in the sense that, you know, this thing's cost so much money, uh, it has had such a long history of problems and all that stuff. Well, apparently they didn't do very much on that, and apparently they didn't do so much looking on this guy other than they found that he was falsifying the records, and then they put him on another project where he was looking at dirts and not at structures, but the point was, instead of firing him, they said, well, we had to go through this elaborate investigation to make sure what's going on. In the meantime, uh, there had been other issues about the inspection and the integrity of the Bay Bridge, and so what we're left with is a bridge that is probably going to survive and operate as designed, but with a big question mark. It's kind of like the Barry Bonds uh, home run ball. It's got an asterisk on it, and that well, is a problem that you know, should not exist. Tom, it's interesting, Caltrans' reaction to this, that um, their initial reaction after the B report came out, uh, which was based on, I think, something, like you said, 50 feet of yeah. documents, yeah. Um, if you were to print it all out. And yet their initial reaction was to, to s go after the journalist a little bit mm -hmm. and to, to try to besmirch the, his reputation, that maybe he didn't know what he was talking about. It reminds me a little bit about the 2004 investigation where documents showed the contractors were hiding worker injuries and other documents showed they were cutting cor corners on welds, that they didn't have the quality control mm -hmm. that they were saying that they did, and, and that perhaps in the end taxpayers weren't getting what they paid for, whether the bridge was going to fall down or not. And it, it's interesting that Caltrans this seems to be their, their mode when something like this comes up. Instead of saying, okay, let's look at how we do things. Is, yeah. is that, well, what are you seeing with this? Well, what I've seen over the years is that it is an agency that is unfortunately over-politicized from the top, which means that it gets a lot of pressure from the governor's office, gets a lot of pressure from the legislature, and in fact, oddly enough, it wasn't until the Sacramento Bee ran its argument, or ran its uh, article, that uh, the Senate called a couple of hearings to say, hey, we better take a look at this. Well, like, well, where were you guys before <laughs> right. this? So, th so the bottom line is that these guys uh, do get a a lot of uh, political pressure from the top. They get a lot on costs because of what it has cost to do this. And as a result, I think they're afraid of being embarrassed. The trouble here is that this foundation testing branch literally tests foundations. And as a result, there's a question mark on this bridge, which may never go away. Well, the legislature is going to hold hearings down. Uh, they've scheduled for the win. Yeah, they've, they've held a couple of hearings already, and I'm sure that there will be more. They've asked for criminal in, uh, intervention, both from the Attorney General's office and from the U.S. Attorney's office, and there will be more to be known. But what is really going to have to happen is that there is a seismic committee that is very prestigious, and they have taken on the job of actually doing some inspections, looking at some of the things, doing additional testing that they may be able to do, some of which is buried way beneath the bay at this point in time. But the point is, there is a lot of work going forward. However, there will still be that asterisk on the side of the bridge. Boy, a big question mark on the mind of many viewers. It's certainly not on my mind here. Yeah. We, we hope that they'll get this into a position that we can all feel comfortable. And I think eventually yeah. we will. Right. Well, there's another story that's been around for a number of years, Marisa, mm -hmm. that you have tonight, and that's the story about the three-strike sentencing law. There is a move underway now to look at that again. That's right. Um, this is a law that passed 17 years ago in the aftermath of the terrible abduction and murder of Polly Class by a, a repeat felon. And what that law aimed to do was say, you know, three strikes and you're out. If you have a history of violence and serious offenses and you commit a third crime, you're going to prison for life. What's happened in the uh, meantime is that we're seeing a lot of cases where people, yes, maybe had two robbery convictions from the 1980s and then they, you know, shoplift lifted some gum or a pair of socks and end up with a 25 to um, year to life prison sentence. So these backers who include a group at Stanford who's been doing a lot of the litigation to, trying to appeal some of these um, harsh sentences um, and a uh, millionaire, David Mills, who's involved with them as well, have come forward with a proposal that would essentially allow people in prison now for life whose third felony was not serious or violent to appeal their sentences um, and folks 
also, in, you know, co going forward to not be able to, to get these sentences. The catch here is that we've seen reform efforts in the past. Mm -hmm. This time around they're saying, yes, if you had rape, murder, child molestation in the past, you can still get thrown in jail for a pair of socks. <laughs> That's okay. Mm -hmm. What we don't want to see um, is people, you know, w as we face an overcrowding order to, to get our prison population down by 30,000 people, as the state faces even bigger budget deficits, they're saying we don't want to see people going to jail, languishing behind bars when they, there's no reason for them to be there. You know, Marisa, mm -hmm. we've been hearing these stories about the guy who stole a pair right. of socks and then went to jail for 25 years for since the law passed. And there have been a lot of people who've tried to reform it, and yet it's always been stopped. Voters don't want it. They, they, they kind of like the law the way yeah. it is. I'm wondering why now. There seems to be maybe more momentum this time. Well, I think they're both trying to seize on the political and economic climate, but there's also a sense this group has really done their homework. They have polled and polled, they have money behind them, they've looked at what voters wanted initially and what they say they want now. And what they've come up with is a very narrow proposal, as opposed to 2006, Prop 66, which um, w would have allowed some of these other folks with really you know, serious, gratuitous offenses in the past at least appeal to the court. And but how many would this affect? I'm sorry, about They think that it, um, about 3,000 of the 4,000 third strikers in prison um, for non serious offenses could actually uh, successfully appeal their sentence. What happens what, if they, yeah, at one time, though, they thought they had it, that they right. thought this was going to really become law. And then Governor Schwarzenegger got involved. So is there a chance that there's a politician on the sideline that will come in at the last minute and well, upset all of this? You know, they're being a little cagey. They haven't even started collecting signatures mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. yet. But when I talked to the folks behind it, there was I, I certainly got the sense they they think that they will have a coalition that not only includes, you know, know, high-profile politicians, but actual law enforcement. They think they can get police, um, maybe even, probably not district attorneys, but, <laughs> but a lot of people in law enforcement behind this. Because what we're seeing, I think, with realignment, this whole move to bring more prisoners back to the local level, um, I think there's a sense among your sort of rank-and-file law enforcement that we're spending too much money incarcerating people that don't need to be there. Well, let me ask you this. What happens if we let these people out? and they steal another pair of socks. What happens then? <laughs> well, um, you know, they couldn't, they, I mean, I think it's important to note that people will still get prosecuted for crimes if they commit them. It's just how seriously and how long are we going to put them in jail. Um, what this doesn't do, which is going to disappoint a lot of people, it doesn't impact second strikers. People who have a second serious or violent felony can still get their sentence doubled. And when I talked to the people who wrote it, they said that's fair. If you commit two robberies, you should have a harsher sentence the second time around. And that's what they've seen that voters are willing to support as well. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a tendency in anything that's like sentencing reform the, the, the fear mongering is really easy to get out there. It's a lot easier to say no to these mm -hmm. things. Um, but I think they feel like they've done their homework to the extent that people could potentially back it. And let's not forget, in 2004, they were this close until mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger and a host of other law enforcement folks came out against it um, with things that in the meantime, we've realized were really not true statements about what it would have done. I mean, mm -hmm. they were saying Charlie Manson could get out. Charlie Manson's not getting that. Well, and he I wasn't have even to, sentenced under three stars. I have to think that the saving money might be a good uh, thing to pitch exactly. right now. Uh, when are they looking to put this on the ballot? For the, this next November, which is going to, it's shaping up to be a election. very crowded ballot in California. So they're going to have their work cut out for them. They still have to raise the signatures to get it there. Well, my thanks to all of you for you. really some uh, very interesting stories tonight. Glad to have you with us. Well, Thursday was World AIDS Day. It's been 30 years since the first reported cases of AIDS, and more than 34 million people around the globe are living with the HIV virus. A new film documents the growth of the National AIDS Memorial Grove in Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco. What began as a grassroots effort is now a national memorial, but not without growing pains. I recently spoke with filmmaker Andy Abramson Wilson about the story, but first, a clip from the documentary, The Grove. Welcome everyone. I'm Jack and I'm with the, uh, a volunteer, but also on the board. And as you know, we have our work days, the third Saturday of the month. It seemed pretty daunting. But I think there were about 200 people at that first work day, and 
it was almost as if we got in there and thought, well, I can do something about this. We didn't want to see lots of reminders of death. Physiological changes happen when people go into nature. So it is a healing space. Just the therapy of going out there and cutting away and planting and to do it in friendship with so many of the people who had a shared experience. So the minute we saw that, we knew that it was a magnificent metaphor and that we had to make it a National AIDS Memorial. Why did you decide to make a film about a memorial uh, and about a memorial that uh, had sort of come out of the community itself. It's part of my history, being a, um, a gay man living in San Francisco. AIDS um, scarred the landscape here. And uh, however, I didn't know about the National AIDS Memorial. I'd been living here 15 years, and I didn't know about it. So when someone from who was on the board of directors of the National AIDS Memorial came to me to ask if I'd be interested in making a film about the Grove, um, I hesitated because I didn't even know it existed. And I think what interested me most was that it was a living memorial. Nature should really be the, not only the metaphor, but also the essence. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was drawn to that. I was drawn to, to that idea of nature being, being the monument itself. And I thought it was perfect for, for the AIDS epidemic. Was it ever in the minds of those who we see who came there once a month to take care of it that this should become a national site? Was that what they were looking for? You know, I think that the, the founders of the Grove were so shell-shocked by what was going on around them, to their community, to the city, really. I don't think it was in anybody's mind what was going to happen years down the road. It was just that, that they needed a place to um, to find solace. They needed a, a place to um, to bring their grief and to find community with other people who are going through the same thing. And I think that they needed a place that was um, that was safe. At the time, AIDS was stigmatized and, and um, people with AIDS were shunned. They weren't welcomed in their families and communities in a large part. And so the, the Grove became um, became that sanctuary for so many people, people with the disease and the, and, the, and the survivors, the people who were left behind. And when Nancy Pelosi uh, brought it to the national spotlight um, and actually was the person responsible for making it a national memorial, I don't think that, that people were, were quite ready for what that meant. I had the bill, but I had to, I decided to latch it on to some other bills that were moving through Congress. I hope that the conference committee will go one step. When you have something that is a priority, that you're simply not going to take no for an answer, eventually you will get your way. Now, this year we have an essential responsibility to designate it a national memorial to the thousands of Americans who have died of AIDS. Gentlemen's recognized. The president signed it into law. We had what we wanted. It became a controversy as to how this, uh, this whole area should look and feel. Really what happens is there's a debate, a debate emerges. There's one side that believes that nature is enough, the natural landscape is enough. It, um, it tells the story of, of, of loss, of death, of regeneration. And then there's others who say, no, we can't keep this as a private garden. We need to make it available to, uh, to the rest of the world. We're a national memorial, and that's our responsibility. Some people are asking questions about whether or not the structure of the current grove can take us into the future, and also whether the landscape as it is now reaches the aspirations of it as a national memorial. The grove is lacking that disruptive, shocking statement that something awful and horrible happened here. And we need you to pay attention to that. What'll happen in 25 or 50 years when 
people with firsthand experience of, of living through that, the dark ages of the late 80s and early 90s are gone. How do we tell the story in a way that will be meaningful for people? And for me, a lovely garden doesn't do it. And the controversy continues. It is not settled. The controversy continues. Um, the, the film actually reignites the question of um, what is an appropriate memorial, an uh, appropriate national memorial. And I think it will go on. You have made a film that has uh, impressed everyone with its beauty and with the controversy that it raises. Is how do we honor people who we love dearly? Thank you, That's Andy, right. very, very much. Thank you. Well, The Grove airs on KQED on December 12th at 10 p.m. You'll find a web extra about the National AIDS Memorial Grove and the ceremonies held there this week at kqed.org slash this week. Also, we are looking for qualified interns currently enrolled in college to work with us here on This Week in Northern California. And there's more information on our webpage. I'm Belva Davis. Good night.